Uh, when I was a kid growing up, as you know, if you're a regular listener uh, or if you've read the book, um, we were desperately poor. My parents and my three siblings and me. And there, there are a couple of reasons why. They didn't have anything to do with the economy and more to do with the uh, dysfunctionality of uh, the chief breadwinner in our family, my father, who was a fucking train wreck, total disaster, a lot of which wasn't his fun but that, uh, or his, uh, his fault, but that's what he was. So my mother had to take up the slack. And going way back to when I was first born, and that was a thousand years ago, my friend. Uh, my mother worked in the waitress business. She was at w a waitress for 35 years until finally she completed some education and, and got a job uh, for the county in which we lived as a social uh, uh, worker, social worker, intake worker. People who were applying for uh, public assistance, she would be one of the first people that they would see and then you know they would have to work their way up the line but all those years that that my mother was a waitress um i can remember numerous times when she would be sick and she would be tired she had four kids we lived in a three-story walk-up a little tiny apartment that had been an attic it was converted to a tiny apartment to um uh, alleviate some of the uh, post-World War II housing shortage that everybody felt. You know, you had two, three, four million men coming home from military service. Where are they going to live? Um, but she was, she was tired and exhausted so many times. Now, my mother was healthy Italian stock. She lived to be 90. But I remember her as a kid just breaking her back to keep us fed and housed in an attic um, and clothed, money for school as we needed it. So uh, before my mother died, the last year of her life, we had long conversations, she and I, uh, about just those events that happened and, and how we lived all those years ago. Because we had, I felt that we had things to talk about. It was apparent to both of us that she was dying. And it was also apparent to us we didn't know how much time was left. And I would hope that every kid and every parent would do that. If, if you have enough time, enough warning, that you talk about those things that you might not have talked about. When you were a kid, you couldn't. When you left home, you got into your own life and you were gone. But there comes a time when, I think, when parents and children, especially adult children, need to talk about things that happened. So we did that, my mother and I. And I, I would talk to her, and, and Kathy witnesses, we were, we were married at the time, uh, and I did it for a year, every night, for an hour, like doing a podcast. <laughs> I would call Sylvia and we would have long conversations. We even would get in arguments. <laughs> you remember that, right? Because I wanted her to come live with Kathy and me. She was living alone uh, until she died and uh, she wouldn't do it. So I would make my best argument, you've got to come and live with us, you've got. And her answer was usually bullshit <laughs> or, or the Italian screaming mother equivalent of that. Um, anyway, watching her Go to work sick time and time and time again. She had four kids. Uh, there was only seven years difference between the youngest and me, the oldest. Consequently, we were constantly bringing home viruses, colds, flus, uh, you know, viral colds, just, just all the stuff that kids bring home when they're kids from going to school. And... So often my mother would, would catch these colds, but she always said, I have to work. I have to work. She would go to work if she had a fever. She'd go to work if she had a cough. She would go to work if, if, if she um, uh, was, was, had a stomach uh, flu, uh, so-called, 
but she had to work because if she didn't, if she missed one or two or three nights tips, what would we have to eat the next day? That's how she rationalized her going to work ill, going to work sick. And again, because she was of a certain family stock, you know, uh, whatever, she lived to be 90, just, I don't know, a couple months short of 90. We say 90. The only adequate remedy for what my mother went through and what young people are going through right now is to permanently, permanently require paid sick leave for hourly workers, all workers. Now, the unions get some of it. I have a friend who I've known for 45 years, and his son and daughter-in-law just had a baby. And the company he works for cares enough about him that they told him, without his asking, we're giving you eight weeks paid leave so you can be with your, your child and your wife. And her company did the same. But they're not hourly workers. They're both professionals. I'm talking about the people who struggle for whatever reason, whether they have four children at home in a made-over attic that they have to feed, or if they are 20-somethings who may have a degree in English or, 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 or math or physics and just can't find a job, and so they're working as a, a, a food server or they're working at gig work, and they know, they fucking know, they have to be to work every day or no pay. The only adequate remedy is to permanently require paid sick leave for all workers. What is it? Well, I know the answer to the question, but what is it about this culture, this society, that, that treats our workers so fucking miserably? Well, it's capitalism. Capitalism is about capital. It's not about people. And capitalism will work your fucking ass until you die. And it doesn't give a shit. Next, put another person in the slot. Get the corpse out of here. That's just the way capitalism is. Socialism does not work that way democratic socialism. And don't look at me now and say, what the fuck are you talking about? What about Stalin? You know, that wasn't communism, or that was communism, but it was, it was a uh, brutal form of, of communism. They called themselves Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Horseshit. Democratic socialism is not capitalism. It is a form of self-governance, that takes into account the fact that we're human. We're fucking human. We have, we live in, in a time when we don't go out and grow or hunt our food. We don't go out and gather nuts and berries. We don't do that shit, okay? That ended 7,000 years ago. So here we are, stuck in, in, in a society that says, consume, buy, spend. Well, you can't do that unless you have income. And you can't have income unless you are paid for the days that you are sick. Nobody alive today or any time chose to be born. Uh, don't give me this mystical shit. We choose our parents in some waiting room that's just beyond the outer limits. Fuck all that. We didn't choose our parents. We didn't choose to be born. So we have to work with what we've got. But why do we have to accept that the top one-tenth of one percent, it, just the United States controls more so-called wealth than, than half the top 20 people in the United States in terms of money value, net worth, have more of that than 150 million Americans. 
Does that make sense to you? Hi, True Seekers. Mike Malloy here. As you know, we've switched formats and are now broadcast exclusively on the Progressive Voices Network. So that means you get fewer program interruptions, no corporate commercials, and lots of profanity. But our format change also means some of our radio listeners no longer hear the program. It's been a while since I mentioned our podcasts, so you may have forgotten that there is a way to listen to this program anytime you need a good dose of screaming. Visit MikeMalloy.com and subscribe to our podcast. You have your choice. You can listen to the ranting with the audio podcast or listen and watch me lose control with a video podcast subscription. As a podcast subscriber, you can download the program to your mobile device and take me with you wherever you go. And if you have a friend who needs a dose of truth-seeking, you can give a gift subscription as well. That's MikeMalloy.com. And never miss a minute of the uncensored fun and frivolity.